It is Monday, November 27th, 2017, and this is the Monday Morning Analyst. Welcome, everyone. My name is Luke Thomas. I'm the host of this podcast. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I don't know how many of you watched the event we're going to talk about uh, over the weekend, but it's the one we have to get to. There actually are some interesting things that came out of it, and of course, I'm talking about UFC Shanghai, and I will talk about that in just a minute. Three parts to the podcast, as always, a review of what happened over the weekend, some multimedia in the second segment with some specificity. And then the third segment, we're going to take a look at what's coming up in the week ahead. As I mentioned, there was, uh, there, I should say, there were some other shows that had some decent action over the weekend, but we're going to focus on UFC Shanghai, or as it's also known as UFC Fight Night Bisping versus Gastelum, or if you're counting, UFC Fight Night 122. This took place at the Mercedes Benz Arena in Shanghai, China. The U- first UFC event on mainland China, of course, it is a series of events um, in Macau. Uh, The attendance sold out, apparently, 15,128, so um, take that for what it is worth. In your main event at middleweight, Kelvin Gastelum defeats Michael Bisping at 2.30 of the first round via KO. Um, He had punched, and I think he was trying to counter Bisping, and then Bisping tries to counter him. Gastelum pulls, and... Uh, I believe Michael missed with a right as he pulls, and then Gaslam hit him with a one-two piece that with a right hand that absolutely caught him. Uh, but maybe it was the no, excuse me, it was the big left. What am I saying? It was the big left that caught him dead to rights and sat him down. Series of shots ended it there. There was a lot of questions after this one about whether or not Michael Bisping should have even been allowed to compete. You know, my initial thought going in was probably not, but if you can get the medical screening. What does it matter? And then my thought was, you know, whatever damage he has has just been baked in. Um, you know, who really cares? Not who really cares, but if you've got two fights left, how much should we really be concerned about it? But I don't know. I feel like you got to do it right until the very end. We probably could have had someone else fight Kelvin. Um, when I say we, like I run the organization. But, you know, I'm just sort of speaking as a community here. It just felt like... Michael Bisping was moving in slow motion. He had a couple moments where he was finding his rhythm a little bit better as it went on, but he was getting tagged too, and I don't know, like whenever he was throwing, it just seemed so labored. And uh, and you know, look, people were saying ahead of time. Uh, I think one of I think one of Bisping's trainers had said, "Well, you know, look, Gastelum poses some challenges for us that are make him much more dangerous than GSP." And folks kind of thought that was ludicrous. GSP just beat him up and choked him out. But the truth is. Um, GSP, you know, is the champion and maybe is better overall if you really want to make that argument. But there are certain specific things that Kelvin Gastelum does really well, and I think he does. Uh, he has great combination punching, um, and he has great hand speed, especially for that weight class. Now, I'm, I'm just kind of shocked it needed the towel to make 186, which is a bit of a separate issue. But um, at, you know, at middleweight, he can just fire the hands so quickly down the pocket with such accuracy, and he can put shots together in a way where if the first one lands. Uh, the second one's going to be quickly right behind it. And you saw that here with brutal power and accuracy as well. So right in the pocket, just a beautiful pullback. And then he caught him. Um, Steven uh, Wright, the trainer, noted how like off balance Michael Bisping was and like lunging and trying to reach. And he was trying to whip around the left hook. And that's when he got caught. So it was just a bad... It was a bad deal for him on that day. I don't know. I don't know how quickly he's going to be cleared to return to training or to compete. I don't know if that March show is too soon. I don't really know what is going to be next for Michael Bisping. That was a really bad loss. But for Kelvin Gastelum, a nice win, nice reminder of what he's capable of after that Chris Weidman win, or excuse me, loss. Well, win for Chris Weidman anyway. Um, you know, look. I think as long as guys are bringing their size to bear in fights, he's going to have problems. But as long as it's going to be like a contest of speed on the outside. You know, you saw what he did to Michael Bisping. He dropped Chris Wyman in, in their first round of their fight. So, Kelvin Gastelum, if he can keep that fight at distance or, you know, just not have to engage too much in any kind of real wrestling or tight waist department, he can do a lot of middleweight. Uh, Li Zhang Lang defeating Zach Otto at 257 of the first round. Just looking pretty fluid, you know. Um, kept fighting at home for that left hook. Sat him down with the right. It was a nice little uh, uh, performance by him, uh, as short as it was. Zach Otto was doing a lot of you know stance switching and trying to find his moment. Never really could. Um, and, you know, he was trying. The stoppage may have been a little bit early there. But overall, I think what you can say about uh, Zhang Lang is that he has really 
uh, dedicated himself to improvement. He just looks like he's able to make better, more clever decisions with his shot selection and what the openings are over time. And he's obviously shown already a willingness to take damage and willingness to sit in the pocket. But if you can take someone who's got that kind of bravery, make their defensive instincts a little bit more, um, you know, try to highlight whatever their defensive instincts might be, really work on that, and then let them uh, turn more sophisticated shot selection into just natural rhythm, right? If you can do that, and I think you're seeing more and more of that from him, he could be, you know, someone who's perhaps formidable. I don't know that he's going to contend for a title anytime soon at 170 pounds, but the amount of improvement he has made and just how much more comfortable he looks is really quite noticeable. Uh, Wang Guan defeating Alex Casares, split decision, 29-28, 28-29, 29-28. 29-28. taking more of a beating in this one than I thought he was ever going to take. Uh, I didn't think he was going to lose, to, for starters. And then, well, heading into the contest anyway, I, I do think the rightful guy won. I'm just saying, he got beat up a lot more in this one than I thought he would have. He, What is his record here? Let me look this up as I speak to you now. 29 years old, still young, but he's been fighting for a while. He's lost three of his last four. Um... And the last one was against Ronaldo D. That's an interesting one. Yeah, he's got some questions he needs to ask himself. He's, his, his record is almost at 500 at this point. I don't know that he's made a ton of improvements over the last few years. Uh, Alex Garcia getting a great win over Muslim Salikov. We were naked choke at 322 of the second round. Smart game plan by him. It's just going right after the takedown, not spending a whole lot of time on the feet when you did. You could see some of the spinning attacks from Salikov. I thought Salikov had decent takedown defense. He did try that one fence grab, but it wasn't enough. Um, Garcia's timing on his takedowns, on his level changes, on his doubles, really superb. Finishing not as strong, but pretty good. Obviously good enough to um, put the fight where he needed to. And then that choke was kind of interesting, right? Because it wasn't on the throat. It was kind of like almost like a bandana, like a bank robber would wear kind of space here. And then, But what you saw was, one, it sank a little lower as got, you're seeing this more and more in mixed martial arts now. Guys are getting the back and they're almost preferring a gable grip because it allows them to pull on this while they drive their hips forward. And so they're bowing their opponents out. And when that happens, it just naturally creates room down here. You're seeing some of that from him. He did that here in this one, even though it wasn't like a perfect choke. And you saw it. He didn't even have great back control, to be honest. Um, he was just using it on that bicep grip, just really kind of pulling. I think they like it because you can get more directional bend when you go gable grip versus... Um, directly onto the bicep. When you get that bicep, it's more about complete control, and it's better. I mean, obviously, this is better, right? If you can, so if you're looking away, you can tuck the hand here, right? This is so, you're not getting this off, right? It's so dominant. But if you have a really tight squeeze, and you're looking real muscular, like a guy like Garcia, um, and you can get that gable grip, well, you can do a lot of damage with that thing. So I'm still interested in seeing more from Muslim Selikov. I know he, had, he was a bit hyped, and he should have been. Uh, I did think I saw enough there in terms of the well-roundedness that his game needs to demonstrate to do well in the UFC. It's just he ran into an Alex Garcia who is getting better about managing his energy, who is getting better about bringing in other dimensions in the game, who fought a smart game plan, didn't go out there and try to just sort of strike it out with the guy who was probably going to be better than him, uh, and got a nice win. Good for him. Uh, okay, Zabit Magomed Sharapov defeating Shaman Morais. Morais at 4.30 of the third round via Anaconda Choke. I cannot say enough good things about Zabit Magomed Sharapov. Whoa. Whoa. I am blown away by this guy. And I was always impressed by him, um, well, at least from what I had seen. And I think he, like, man, if you didn't walk away from this fight here with him thinking this dude might be, I'll, I'll just say it outright. This is absolute championship material. There is no denying it. There is no denying it. Wow. Why? Well, you can notice how well-rounded he is, but you have to ask yourself, why is he well-rounded? Well, he trains hard and he focuses on all the various dimensions and he has a natural aptitude for them when training. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is his game is designed around having well-roundedness. And by that, you can look at it this way. He can probably spark you out with a shot if he needs to. He can probably get a quick submission if you want to like jump on a guillotine. He's got a certain amount of lethality at any point in a fight if he really wants it. But what his game is built around is constant attack in all different directions 
to create confusion, to create bad habits from the person defending the attacks. And all the attacks have built-in back doors so that no matter what you choose, he can go another direction and just pile on attack, on attack, on attack, on attack. He is constantly building on his own attacks. He is constantly switching directions. He is constantly switching phases, dimensions. He is forcing you to make bad choices, and as you do, he takes advantage of them. But in order to do that... You have to be able to play all the levels. You have to play top control, bottom control, grappling, wrestling, throws from the wizard, double legs, um, you know, striking at distance, striking on the inside, clinch. You have to be able to play all the levels because you're constantly moving, you're constantly aggressing, you're constantly changing directions, you're constantly having to use different pieces of the game to build on the last one. You're constantly setting traps in misdirection and then taking advantage of your opponent's labored, difficult, poor choices and ultimately overtaking them. It's not like he just linearly drives in a direction and tries to get something. He eventually wants to get to that place, but he goes like this to get there. Well, to do that, you have to have so many different things in your command. You have to be able to play the levels, and that's what he does. His game requires him to have well-roundedness, because he, that's the way he likes to play, and because he has it at such absurd levels already, uh, he just overwhelms you. And he, he doesn't necessarily overwhelm you in one go. It's just this accumulative speed chess. You just can't play with this guy. I'm blown away by him. I'm so amazed by him that I really think he's... he. I, I don't know that it's unfair to say, number one, as I mentioned before, championship material. And two, this might be the next big thing in mixed martial arts. Um, you know, We'll see. There's still some questions he has to answer. There's still a couple of things where you could tighten up on his technique if we really want to nitpick, and we do. Uh, we want to compliment him. But there's a couple of things he could have done a little bit differently. Um, but I think what I see from him is absolute total potential against any other kind of fighter. Uh, he's He appears to be amazing. So some questions to be answered are, one, you know, how does he deal with an opponent who probably would get in his face and do mind games? Um, still some questions about cardio in the fourth and fifth round. He looked like he wasn't gassing at all in this one, but nevertheless, you know, we want to see somebody in some championship rounds. Um, you would want to see him in a lot of different scenarios that we still haven't yet. If someone rocks him, how does he respond? Uh, that kind of, how does he respond to getting cut? There's all, all different kinds of challenges that, that still need to be answered for. But what we've seen thus far is, if you're not impressed with that guy, I don't know what you're waiting on, man. Because he is something special. Mark Henry told me about that guy when I didn't even ask. I was interviewing Mark about somebody else, and he just brought me. He's like, yo, you've got to believe me. And coaches tell me this kind of thing all the time. Oh, I got this kid coming. I got this kid coming. And they might really believe that. Ultimately, you know, things can just pan out a certain way, and sometimes they just don't pan out a certain way. This guy is a, is appears to be everything they have told me he was, and then some. I am absolutely amazed by Zabit Megamed Sharapov. Um, and Shaman Rice, by the way, is no slouch. You know, for him to just get bodied the way he did is is crazy. Uh, Song Keenan defeating Bobby Nash in like 15 seconds. Weird. Nash accidentally hits his cup. They restart. He tries to punch. He gets countered over the top and then ultimately dropped. Uh, Yang uh, Shionan, Shionan? Forgive my pronunciation. Defeating Kalen Curran. 29-28 and then 30-27 on one of the scorecards, so two 29-28s. Caitlin Curran becoming the first woman in the UFC ever with six losses. Um, always has some pretty good offense, never really has great defense. Uh, always appears to be getting hit, both entering and leaving clinches uh, and, and the pocket as well. Doesn't have a lot of head movement. Had some at the very end of the fight, strangely. But it appeared to me that Xionan, however you pronounce it, had really uh, strong punching power. And that was, I think, forcing Curran to reconsider what she was doing at different intervals and then to get overwhelmed and, in fact, dropped a couple of times, too. Song Yadong, the man who launched a thousand jokes about genitalia, defeating Barat Kendari at 416 of the first round. This kid looked like he had lightning in his hands, man. He could just explode into position. He just measured it. Popped him over the top, and that was all she wrote. Kandari uh, fought okay up until that point. Uh, had a nice jab, had a good reach, had good use of it, but he just got overwhelmed and dropped. And then we tried to recover. You know, this 19-year-old kid just slapped on this 10-finger. It was a 10-finger guillotine or a go-go choke, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I know they're different, but um, but uh, in any case, that's what he finished him off with. Shamil Abdurakhimov defeating Chase Sherman at 124 the first round. Kept finding a home for the left hook. Uh, set him down with more than that. Actually, a right did more damage, and a left kind of closed the show. But he kept finding an opening for that. He had good fakes and fangs, got Chase Sherman to chase on and bite on 
uh, any of uh, or several of those attempts, and then we were able to counter them over the top afterwards. You know, I don't know how much to say about it other than it was a nice win, but um, Chase Sherman got caught, you know, uh, biting on things a little bit too easily, and then paid for it early in the fight. Uh, Gina Mazzani defeating Wu Yanan. Nothing really to say about this one. 327 across the board. Rolando D defeating Wuliji Borin. Uh, 30, 27, 29, 28, 30, 27, not a particularly remarkable contest. And then Cyril Asker defeating Hu Yao Zong at 233 of the second round. Two guys who are a little bit heavier set, kind of just use, you could see, uh, Cyril Asker using one of these, like, folk-style leg rides to really just lean on the guy and overall and just break him down, take his back, work from there. Did it in the first round, did it in the second round, ultimately got the rear naked choke from that position. But, again, not a whole lot of something interesting to say about it. Uh, five of the night, there was none awarded. However, your performances of the night went to Kelvin Gaston, Li Zhang Lang, Zabit Magomed Sharapov, and Song Keenan, or Kanan, however they want to call it. Um, all right, so I just ranted and raved about how great Zabit Magomed Sharapov is. One of the things he did well in this, and you could make a uh, Monday Morning Analyst about a number of different things he did, but one of the things he did that really, really caught my attention was his use of neon belly. You don't see a lot of this in high-level MMA. You see a little bit of it in high-level jiu-jitsu merely as like a point-scoring phenomenon, or sometimes for control as well, but it's just harder to maintain at the top levels, um, which is why even in MMA it's interesting. This is a position that not a lot of people use, but if you know how to use it, Man, you can do a lot with it. He puts on a borderline master class with Neon Belly in this fight. That's what I want to pay attention to now. Let's see how he did it. So what is Neon Belly? Neon Belly is a way in which you can ride an opponent by putting your knee essentially on their sternum, on their waist, or on their chest. Not just your knee, but your knee and your whole shin. That's more or less what it is. Now, there's a lot of complicated different ways you can use it. There's a lot of different applications of it. Some ways right, some ways wrong. Uh, some ways wrong depending on what you want to do. Some ways right. It, it's just a, it's a very diverse position, but the basic idea is you are resting your knee and, of course, your whole shin uh, either across their waist or you can wear it sort of side to side from like hip to shoulder, opposite hip to opposite shoulder. A lot of different ways you can play with it, but that's basically what it is. And Magomed Sharapov... He has such command of this position. Here's how he uses it. One, he uses it merely as a control mechanism for someone's hips. Two, he does it to set up attacks on the upper body, which uh, they themselves set up then Sharapov's, Mega Man Sharapov's ability to then go and take mount. Right, So he's using it to pass, he's using it to threaten with ground and pound, he's using it for both at the same time, depending on which decision you make. And again, just as a way to sort of post it, he does it as a way to constantly threaten the mount, even if he doesn't even want to take it. He has all different kinds of ways to use Neon Belly, and you just don't see this kind of thing that often at the highest levels in mixed martial arts. Why? Well, because it takes a lot of time to work on something like that. A lot of guys aren't good at applying it. A lot of people don't want to apply it. A lot of guys don't want to take mount unless it comes really easy because they don't want to have to worry about getting bucked and then reverse. But that's the great part about Neon Belly. You can take mount more so when you want. You're constantly, you, you, it's this always this moment where it's almost like a gun to your head where you don't know if someone's going to pull the trigger or not, but that mere threat sort of freezes people a little bit, right? You can't get out of Neon Belly just by bucking typically. You need to buck and then get a knee in front and get a hand down it just occupies your energy it occupies your mental space it occupies your hands literally to go and do things with it so it, it is a very very difficult thing to deal with especially when you guy like especially when you have a guy excuse me like zabit megamed sherapov on top of you absolutely crushing you with it so we're not going to look at every single thing he does in this fight but we're going to pay attention to how he uses neon belly so here he is on the back of Marais. Let's see what happens here as he moves along. He's going to drop the hook because he's going to want to lift him and throw him. You see his hips are now lower than Marais's. He's going to try to pop his hips forward, pick up, and turn. Now Marais sees this coming, and you can see puts in, what I, I don't know what the name of it is, but I just treat it like an emergency break. If someone wants to stand up while you're triangle them, you put your arm underneath or behind the leg, and it acts as like an emergency break. They can't move any further. Same thing with this. If you're trying to get slammed, someone's trying to slam you, you stick your leg behind theirs like that. He actually double crosses it, and they can't. you can't go because you now attached yourself to them, right? They would have to go with you. So what does he do? He says, okay, I'm going to lift my own leg in the air, which is going to give me the elevation and turn I need. I'm just going to dump you on your side. A very, very nice counter to that. And you can see he goes down pretty hard and he kind of crashes with him. Look at the angle here. This shoulder makes impact and carries all the weight. That is nicely done by Megamed Sharapov. And then he comes up. I've talked about this position before. 
I just want to go over it again. This is called leg drag. Leg drag is a much more common position in MMA and Jiu-Jitsu now than it was five, six years ago. It is where you are basically on top of them. They have their outside leg to the outside of your hips. Sometimes this can be on the other, on this other leg here will be on this one. Uh, it's almost like an, it's like a half guard without, without a knee shield. Um, and it's a great way for you to get to a lot of different positions. You can easily pass the side if they extend out. You can use this if you have a gi. You can grab the lapel, put your elbow on the back of this knee. You can stomp on them. You can slide to mount. You can do a lot of different things from leg drag. But that's what this position is. You're splitting their hips, splitting their legs. Major outside leg on top comes around the back of the hip. And this one is usually on like a bottom leg, like almost like a half guard. But he's got his other one extended because he got thrown. But this, this right here, leg drag. It's a loose leg drag, by the way, but it's leg drag. Uh, okay, he just decides to come around to pass. This is a very common thing to get a pass to the side from from leg drag. No big deal there. Now he comes up and he goes to neon belly. And what do you notice about his neon belly here? First of all, look how low he is, right? His weight is sagged down. He's covering the hips. This elbow is all the way behind. He's got a nice control around the head. He didn't just take neon belly. He took neon belly when he established the conditions of control first that make it possible. And his weight is still down when he does it. He doesn't bring his body weight up and then try to do it like some people. That's how they used to teach you. They used to teach you like raise your body weight up with your hands, create space, and then put the knee in between. But that only works if you've got an opponent who's dog tired. If they're fresh like this, it's just not going to go. He keeps everything down, hips controlled, head controlled, at least to some extent, right? He's, he's threatening this arm by trying to scoop underneath it, which you don't want to go. So he's doing you two-way attacks here. He's threatening this kind of scoop. He's got his hand up here while he's going to knee on belly. Right, and, and and you know if you have knee on belly, a it hurts, b it's draining you, c you don't know if the guy's going to go to mount, you don't know what he's going to do. So now you got all kinds of different problems that you have to address. So he drops it back down, he lets it go, he decides not to take it. All right, inside control, you can see still covering the hips, creating separation between the elbow and the ribs, occupying that space, keeping his weight nice and heavy, nice and sagged all the way down. Right, what's he going to do? He's going to, let's see, uh, you see Marish move his knee up to block the space here. He's going to center his hips down for just a second as he's figuring out what he's going to do. Elbow behind the head here, so he's controlling, the, isolated this arm. Right, so now, so now if you're Marish, you don't want to allow the pass and you're worried about this arm because it's been separated now. A lot of things can happen. He can reach up and try and kimuro you. He can straight arm bar. He can do lots of things. So he's going to switch his hips, so kind of sag them down and out like he's kind of turning them towards the face of Marais, right? And then as he does that, he pushes the weight down on the neck. So he establishes control over the neck before he tries to move his knee back into position. And he does just that, right? So you're controlling. If, if, if the head and the hips are the most important things to control and you can't control both at the same time, you got to pick one, you just go for the one that's available and then the other one opens up a little bit more seamlessly and that's exactly what you see here, right? And then he uses that to come all the way over into mount. I want to make a point about this. A lot of people try to take mount like they're jumping over all the back of a horse, right? You never want to do that if you can avoid it. Sometimes it can work, but ideal way is to get it here, slide it across, Slide your knee across like that, flat, everything connected, friction, and then whip your leg over like a, like a windshield wiper when you get to the other side, which is what he does. Now you can see Marais bridges and turns here. You can see he turns to his side, and you can see he's pressing his arms in because he wants to capture that leg, which he's able to do. You can see he slides under it right there, and then he takes it as he, as he shrimps over to the side. Now he's captured at least the other side. Of the, uh, he's, he's captured the side that's doing a lot of the knee on belly. But even if that's captured, if he can still get his knee past the hip line, which you'll see he does a lot of, you can still manipulate their hips. You can manipulate their legs. You can still take advanced positions by you can knee cut back to the inside or you can just slide all the way over. You'll see that as time goes on. Now he sits up here. Marais tries to underhook here and stand uh, and is not. Let's see what happens here. Is this connected? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know why I took that shot, but here we go. 44, what's his hips are doing? They're facing Marais, right? And again, weight is down, really down, knee, uh, toes here pressing into him, right? What's he going to do? Uh, as Marais creates a frame to block the elbow, uh, Magomed Sherpov reads it and slides the knee through, just like that. Waits for you to brace against it, creates a pocket and takes advantage of it and comes up the top, just like that. You see Marais try to roll and roll the other way. Magomed Sherpov posts on his head to prevent that and when it comes back down he's going to capture that arm 
Now, at this point, you can see he's got his hand back inside, which is what he wants. He doesn't want his hand all the way outside, but he can't quite get his elbow back to his ribs, right? He can't quite tuck it back into tight position because he has been scooped by the right leg there, Megamed Sharapov. Right, and then he keeps doing that. Look at look at him, head down, knee down, way to sag. Be, you can't just bench press a guy like that off of you. You can see he raises his hips here like that. Look at him bridge all the way. Moresh has bridged, but that just gives him room to do that. When you when you bridge like that and you come down, a you can create room by doing this. Look, it's wide open now. I mean, yes, it's in the air, but it's open. Or when you come down, sometimes people will have a relaxed posture. They won't be quite as fluid and mobile. If they're a big burst of energy like that, they don't quite have their defensive instincts. Mega Machiropov waits it out, takes it, knee on belly, boom. And look at him dropping his weight down. So in this scenario, it's not putting as much weight on his hips, which is why Marais doesn't freak out, but it, it does enough to you know threaten him. Now again, through your mind again, you're like, I got to get it off. I got to get it off. I got to get it off. Wait, what are my hands doing? What's he doing? How do I address two concerns in opposite directions at the same time? That's the kind of confusion and control um, that a good knee on belly can establish. And here he just slides it. You can see this is the foot here of Megamed Sharapov right into mount. Boom. And he comes up and just starts striking away. And I think we're deep into the second round at this point. Here he is, pressing down on the hand. He's moved to mount. He's going to take away his own mount after he lands a nice elbow. He's going to actually, he's in mount. He's going to bring this leg over and then go back. Look at that. He's going to go back to knee on belly as a alternate choice. Because now, rather than using the scoop of this inside when you're inside control, now he can use it and set it up from knee on belly. So it's two different kinds of rides. He's got knee on belly and he's got a, hand, a knee, excuse me, in here on the bicep. And hey, look at his posture, totally down, weight down, base down, not on live toes, but that's okay. Cause sometimes that allows you to sink even lower. You feel a little bit more uh, secure in the position, depending on what you're doing. And he's banging on Marais anyway. Just want to point out now, you can see all the different rides he's got now. Doesn't like what he can see from mount, boom, go to knee on belly. I'm still in a dominant position where I can control. If you turn into me, I, can, I know what's going to happen. If you turn away, I know what's going to happen. I can slow the direction. I can set up attacks no matter what. And from here, now, I'm just going to give you a different look. I'm going to go knee on belly while I slide that up and begin to attack. Look at that. I mean, this is just absolutely a horror show for uh, for Shaman Marais, man. There's just nowhere to go. Now, he eventually gets out of it a little bit here, knees down. He's going to go behind the head, and he's got the hips as well. But you can see Marais is just constantly, constantly, constantly in a bad position. This is knee shield. Right, what he's got here, he's got the shin in the in the stomach. He's pushing away. He's you don't have to be this far off your shoulder, but um, it's an it's a uh, protection against what he's doing. And what is you can see when you're like this, if you want, if you can free this bottom leg, uh, you can see this one's not hooked. So if you can drop your weight down, hold one of their legs in position with your hands, and scoop around this corner, you can see you can now take side control. And look how low he gets. Nice and low, right? Here he is coming up now. He's going to control the hips. He's got all the way around, right? So he's 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 moving up. He does not have knee on belly. Now, from straight side extended, he's coming up on this shoulder. So you can see three different ways he's now launched this. From straight side facing, straight side hips down, knee on belly. Uh, he, he's done it all. And it's part of the knee on belly sequence because you're attacking up here. They're not focused on their hips. Right? Look at that. He, he, what is Moresh worried about now? He doesn't want to get punched in the face. He's worried about this being controlled. He hates everything about this, right? He's getting punched, dominated. This is terrible. So what does he do? Megamed Sharapov, he's going to come up. He's going to control the head. Look at that nice, tight shoulder control, shoulder pressure, I should say. Right? And you can see Moresh is trying to get that knee in here. He just jumps around it. Look at that. He just steps right around. I should, jump is not quite correct. He steps around it. There's your knee on belly. Boom. Right? So... When you're down here, you're thinking about, oh my God, I just want to get stopped being punched. This is terrible. This is terrible. You know, come up here, control it. You think you're closing off the space. He's going to lean into you. Now you're, it's going to be harder for your hips to move because your shoulders and your head have been controlled. Boom. Here comes the knee on belly again. And he's just going to look at the, look at him digging in to the organs and the ribs here. Let me assure you folks, this is not money. If you are Shaman Shem Morais, Morais, however you pronounce it, this is super not money. This is a not money position for you. This is horrible. To have someone digging into your organs and your ribs and your hips like this, no me gusta. All right? 
Uh, so here we go. He's going to, Moresh realizes this is just God awful. And now you see turns into him, but look what happens when he turns into him. He can control how far he goes. He's got an arm back here in case he wants to go for a shoulder or his hips. He's the one who's on top. He's and the arm is flailing. He could jump for an arm bar here. You look at many options of control and offense you have when you have good knee on belly. It's so much you can do. He decides to come over, trap the arm. Now this knee has been scooped. Or I should say the ankle's kind of been scooped here. The knee is a little bit past, so it's not quite knee on belly here because it's kind of elevated. But what you can do with that is, you can see it's kind of trapped. What you can do is, and by the way, look how far he separated the elbow from the ribs. Occupied his entire left side of his body, giving him total control. So now Moresh is like, oh my God, what do I, what do I, what do I uh, stop here? Do I stop him trying to pass or to mount? Do I, do I try to get my arm back in? What do I prioritize here? He's making you pick your poison. It's hard to deal with both at the same time. Now, eventually he gets up. This is the third round. There's not much more to this. I want to show you this. He is really good, Magomed Sharapov, at getting his opponents into motion. And then once they're into motion, then, you know, launching some kind of a takedown or some kind of a guard pass. But he's really good. If you're static like this, you're putting your hips back, hard to take you down. Puts you in motion, it's a lot easier. So he leans on it. He kicks out a post leg, turns. Let me go here. He is in the space he wants him to be. So he's going to kick this leg out and move out of the way and then bring Morais to that space. And immediately, what do you notice from that knee? Comes right up. Boom. Takes it to control the hips as he comes up. Weight sagging into him. Hips turned away. Boom. Look at that. Right back to it. Here it is right here. Here's his leg right here. Right back to it. Right back to it. And then he's going to slide, I think, all the way over into mount. Yes, he is. So now he's in mount. He can stretch him out here. Let's see how this fight finishes. Oh, actually, I think there's one more burst here. So this is right after. If you remember, he was had his feet on the fence, and he burst out and couldn't quite get a turn or get out of the um, mount. So here, from mount again, by the way, he's got it hooked here to prevent any kind of hand to like hip control, right? If he wants to put his hands on your hips to move you. Now you've created a blocking mechanism to stop that. You've mo removed his elbow from his ribs. You guys are going to hear me repeat the same things over and over with, with the Monday Morning Analyst because inside fighting, inside control is so fundamental to so many different positions. He's going to bring this leg like a windshield wiper. He's going to bring his heel to his rear end and then like that. You see that? Rather than just kind of jump off a horse, jump on a horse. You windshield wiper on top and now he is back in uh, Neon Belly and... Morais can't get the underhook because he's got the underhook here. This is it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Look at that total control, total control. And he, instead of having a leg out and posted, he can keep everything nice and tight with his base right on his you know his ankles and his rear end together like that. Pretty amazing, right? So he kind of lets it go because Sharapov kind of moves out of the way. Here's his knee. His knee is facing like the camera here, so that's kind of a weird position to torque on his knee. Here's what he does with it. Look at Morais's uh, hips. They're facing this way. Look, see his two knees here. Watch what he's going to do. This is a common thing you can do. Now, usually if you have your knee all the way through and your foot is trapped, you can take this and then kick the top leg out and you can slide your leg out. He doesn't really do that. I don't know why he doesn't do that, but whatever. But Morais gets the underhook here. But because he has control of his hips, when he brings that knee, this knee right here, that's this knee. So as he brings it across the body, he brings the legs with him, does he not? Yes, he does, just like that, because he had attached his foot inside of there. So as he brings it across, he flattens his opponent out, takes away that underhook's value, and then it can begin to go back to try to take him out. Now, he doesn't, he can't take him out here. He does get the underhook, but you know, I, want, I just want to point out here one more time why this is so big. He can't get his foot out, but if I can control this, I can just whip it across the body, like knee on belly, and his 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 knees will come up and over. He will face forward correctly, right? Here he is. So he gets the underhook, and he turns him flat, Magomed Sharapov, by not allowing him to sit up, uh, by turning his hips flat with his own with his own foot in there, right? Using that lock on his foot against Marais. And he tries to sit up here. He posts on a hand. You can see, look at the knee is just holding him in place, right? And look. Obviously, Morais is strong as an ox and very technical. I, I'll give him some credit. But you can see how much control it, it affords you when you can just pin your weight to somebody like that. So he comes down. He gets his hips centered under him. But at that point, Magomed Sharapov switches his grip. He comes up here, fires the hand through. He's going to readjust. He's going to lock up the bicep grip. Now, this part is interesting to me. Typically, what's done here 
is you bring him down to their base like this. Now he's sitting and it's kind of weird, so maybe because he's sitting he does this, but typically what you want to do is you want to tuck your head in between the space here and you want to roll through to get up on top. It's called a gator roll, common from this position. Um, they use it, by the way, almost identically in uh, wrestling. I mean, that's where it comes from. It's called a gator roll, but you can finish it with the anaconda choke. But you have to roll to the same side as the locking mechanism. He actually does the opposite. He tries to take him and roll him backwards. This is typically a no-no because it's hard to block. It looked like he was using this knee before on the outside of this one to create a block. But if you can post with the hand, they typically can stop it. Somehow Mega Machirapal readjusts and then just snatches him over. You can see he's on his knee and his elbow, and he just kind of forces him over. This is not the way you're supposed to do it. I don't know why he did it this way. Maybe he's got a good pull. Maybe he's got a good squeeze. But typically, it's the gator roll because there's nothing to block them from going underneath that side when you tuck your head underneath and roll through on that position. And so you end up in the same spot, but it's a lot harder to get there. you got to muscle it. And here's how he finishes this choke. You can see here something I want to show you. You're going to want to bring like your stomach, your chest, sternum, depending on where it is. You're going to want to bring it underneath the head if you can, but certainly against it as well. And he taps because he's going to walk towards the head, walk towards the hips. But you'll notice he taps. Watch when he gets the knee underneath the elbow. Marais is trying to create a frame here. But what, look at that. Once he sinks that all the way under, look at how tight that is. And that's when he begins to tap. And I believe, yeah, right there, he taps. You can see. It was once he scooped underneath that elbow, he was able to really twist into the position the way he needed to. So it's a nice win. But the real story of that, to me, is that knee on belly... It mentally wore down his opponent. It physically wore down his opponent. It created too many fronts by which Morais had to challenge Megamed Sharapov. He had to worry about his flanks and everything in front and then behind him, right? He's just so many different directions, so many different looks. He just had a hard time figuring out what was going to happen next. And he was playing catch up the whole time. When you play catch up against a guy like Zabit Megamed Sharapov, you're probably going to lose. It is a busy, busy week of mixed martial arts coming up. You have a lot to enjoy. Uh, if you didn't get your fill over the weekend, there are going to be three, there's more than this, of course, but three major events you want to pay attention to. Let's start with the first one, Bellator 189, Bud versus Blenco 2. This will be at the Windstar World Casino in, you guessed it, Thackerville, Oklahoma, the land that time forgot. Uh, in the main event, Julia Budd will defend her women's featherweight Bellator title against Arlene Bel uh, Blenko at middleweight. Rafael Lovato, or Rafael Lovato, excuse me, I always forget that he's not Brazilian. Rafael Lovato Jr. Def uh, faces off against Chris Honeycutt. That should be a hell of a contest. Hisaki Kato is back against Chidi Njikawani. That should be a fun striking contest. And David Rickles faces off against Adam Piccolotti, who just came off that loss uh, to um, uh, Goichi Yamauchi. Uh, and that'll be at a catch weight, however, of 160 pounds. On the preliminary card, two fights to look out for there. Alexis Dufresne taking on Amber Liebrock. And then Sam Cecilia is back against Marco uh, Marcos Galvan. Now, there are two UFC events as well coming up. Uh, the finale for the Ultimate Fighter 26 will take place on Friday. This will be at the Park Theater in... I'm not sure where. Where the hell is the Park Theater? Anyway, this is the Ultimate Fighter finale... 26, uh, or a New World Champion finale, as it's been called. Here is the fight card as it's been placed to date. Um, obviously, one of the finalists is going to face off against Nico Montano. Um, that's a women's flyweight contest. At middleweight, Andrew Sanchez taking on Ryan Janes. Joe Soto versus Brett Johns. Terry Ware versus Sean O'Malley. Eric Spicely versus Gerald Mearshart. And I believe Priscilla Cote. Cachoeira takes on Lauren Murphy. I believe some other bouts are going to be added to this, but have not yet, to my knowledge. When they, uh, I suspect it'll be just some, some from the show. And then the big one, the day after, December 2nd, this, is, of course, is going to be UFC 218, Holloway versus Aldo 2. This takes place at the Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, Michigan. Great card. Max Holloway facing off against Jose Aldo. Alistair Overeem versus Francis Ngannou. Henry Cejudo taking on Sergio Pettis. That one is quite the sleeper. Eddie Alvarez versus Justin Gaethje. Tisha Torres versus Michelle Waterson. Then on the preliminary card, Charles Oliveira versus Paul Felder. Great fight there. Alex Oliveira versus Yancey Medeiros. David Tamer taking on Drakkar Close. Felice Herrig versus Courtney Casey. That one is also falling underneath the, um, uh, well, 
not coming up on everyone's radar. Abdul Razak Al Hassan takes on Sabah Homasi. Jeremy Kimball versus Dominic Reyes. Justin Willis versus Alan Crowder. And then Amanda Cooper versus Angela Magana. All right. So that's it. Uh, there'll be a ton to get to uh, all week long. And then, of course, with the next week's uh, Monday Morning Analyst. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can send me an email, LukeThomasNews at gmail.com. You can also, on Facebook and Instagram, just use the words Luke Thomas News, and I come right up on both of those. Thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe to MMA Fighting. Like this video. I will talk to you next Monday. And until then, enjoy the fights.